So up on, up on stage, I think uh, a lot of you have met or had a chance to meet um, prior to the event here. But uh, just, to, just to go around, we've got uh, Corey Atley. Corey. We've got David Hula. David. Jenna and Levi Oshner. And Randy Dowling. So thank you all for joining us here. And uh, I know everybody's interested in hearing some of your thoughts and insights. But before we get started on that, why don't you just tell us a little about where you're from, and, and what your farm is, or what, what your main activity is on that farm. So you want to start? In sure. Region? Yep. Um, I'm Levi Oxner from Sutton, Nebraska, and uh, my job on the farm is uh, all the seed chemical orders and the uh, day-to-day management. Um, I do it right alongside my wife and my dad. Uh, we farm 2,000 acres of uh, corn and soybeans and uh, have about 125 cows every year. I'm Jenna Ochsner. I farm alongside Levi and his family's fifth generation farm. Um, I kind of do whatever the farm needs me to do that day. Along with the corn soybeans, and, corn, soybeans, and cattle, we also have a family crop insurance business that Levi's dad and grandpa kind of spearhead. And then I'm in charge of marketing some of our beef straight from, straight from our farm to the consumer as well. Well, I'm Dave Hewler from Charles City, Virginia. And before I explain what our operation is, I just want to commend BASF because Randy and I had an opportunity to go to Germany a couple of weeks ago. And the commitment BASF, had, BASF has for helping us become better growers and to have the tools to where we can achieve the successes that we have, I, you know, I just can't applaud y'all enough. So thank y'all for that and for this opportunity to visit with y'all. Also, you know, I'm from Virginia. As what I do, I'm a farmer. So you name it. I just found out I'm a climatologist. <laughs> so, yeah. So um, I got two younger brothers, a uh, dad that's retired, and a son. And you know, we're in the seed business as well as rose, raising row crops. And but first of all, thank y'all very much for this. My name's uh, Corey Alley from Cedarville, Ohio. We uh, are uh, West Central Ohio. We farm 8,000 acres of uh, corn and soybeans there. Uh, me and my father are on, on the farm with a, with a slew of other employees there. But uh, my main job is uh, pretty much taking care of the, of the inputs and the day-to-day -day operations, making sure everything stays running. I'm Andy Dowdy, uh, farming in North Florida and South Georgia. Just my home farm is about 20 miles north of uh, the Florida line. I'm a first-generation farmer. I've uh, been farming, my first crop was in 2006, we grew corn, peanuts, soybeans. A little on 2,000 acres, we double crop as many acres as we can uh, in that mix. Um, as David said, we did get to go to Germany. Uh, we got to spend some time with Robbie and Josh while we were there. We got to meet a lot of cool people. And the people that's uh, the decision makers, the forward thinkers, is, I don't think I've ever been asked to think 10 years out. <laughs> As many times as I was asked when I was in Germany. Or in 2050. Yeah. <laughs> Where do we need to be as a company in 2050? And I'm like, I don't know that I can answer that. <laughs> but uh, they are definitely a forward thinking company. We were actually able to see the people that come up with the molecules, that, the products that we actually get to use, and that was pretty cool. Uh, we were able to see that you know, there's a lot of innovation going on, there's a lot of forward thinking. And we were able to share some ideas of where we thought they needed to go and how to make some of the things they have better. And then uh, also learn maybe different ways that we could use them on our farm to be more successful. And as far as my day to day role, um, I answer the phone about 3,000 times, um, <laughs> send texts and emails, uh, decision making and marketing, seed sales, what's going to get planted. If we make a crop, Due to drought, I mean, what we will market and sell, you name it, I wear a hat and coat of many colors. Well, let's just let's jump right in because I think it, you, the theme is record breaking yields. So, why don't we let's talk about uh, for the first question for the group is uh, around what do you do year to year that's allowing you to uh, to have record breaking yields? Well, uh, first, I think you, I don't know who you're Go you ahead, no, it, it's for, for anybody. Um, I think you have to be a student of the crop, number one. You have to understand where yield is captured, and you have to understand where yield is lost. And it's hard for us to manage anything without having data. 
one of the cool things that David and a professor challenged me when we started having success in early in my career was <clears throat> anybody can do it once, now duplicate it. Now replicate what you've done. And to do that, you've got to understand the science, and you've got to have some data to make better decisions. And I think that uh, with us, what we do is we, we, we like to have data, we like to understand and know where that yield is kept and where it's lost, and we take an approach of knowing what to do as opposed to hoping. Well, I know for, for, for our operation, we're constantly trying on different products, uh, different ways of thinking of trying to raise more crops per, per year. Uh, you can't stay idle. Uh, probably with the prices the, the, the way they are today, we're not doing it you know, for advancement so far for other people, but as much for ourselves. We need every bush well as, as well as we can just to keep our head above water. And so we need things that pay, practices that pay. And the best way to find that out is on your own soil. So we're constantly trying different things. We probably trial 30 different products, 20 different hybrids every year. You know, we have 8,000 acres, and we try to have as many different trials as, as we can out there to learn from. Excellent. Well, um, use one of Randy's sayings, have your, see your shadow in your field. So being out in the field, but networking. I think that's extremely important because as you're looking at trying to do better from one year to the next is we've just had an uncanny ability to surround ourselves with really knowledgeable people. And so that allows us to make better decisions. And I don't ever use weather as an excuse. It just makes me change the management in season. But just having that opportunity to know where you are and be the student of the crop like Randy it's just, it's horrible to follow Randy and Corey now. You take out the idea. But, um, just know you got 616. I know. 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 I think one of the neatest things about Dowdy being a first generation farmer, he doesn't have all these preconceived notions. Uh, and, and if he surrounds himself or networks with the right folks, uh, I just remember when he and I first started communicating, you know, look where he's at today. And I like to think I had a little bit of piece of that, but not much. He's just been, a, you know, like all of us, surrounding ourselves with good folks. Yeah, I think trying new things, and you are in a unique position, Randy. We come from a generational farm, so we kind of have to break through what dad and grandpa have always been doing and them not being as risky and then us wanting to take a risk and try new things because we're not going to get better results if we keep doing what we've always done. So trying new things and proving to dad and grandpa along the way that it's a good idea. And, and that's not easy when I got the fertilizer machine tore apart five days before we start <laughs> fertilizing. <laughs> uh, moving cultures around, getting you know, more nutrients in the root zone. And, uh, but uh, yeah, we just try to, try to do something different on each farm and uh, keep the data, and I like to see data on my own farm, um, and you know, prove it on my soil, my row spacing, my fertilizer, and uh, but yeah, like, like they all said, it, it, it takes a team, and it's all got to come together and it's all work. So, so give us an example of, of one thing that you're going to do. So you guys are all forward looking, you're all you know, doing your demos on your farms and in comparisons. So tell me one thing you're thinking about doing different this year. To, uh, that you're going to adopt, that you tried this past year, maybe the past several years? Um, I'm, I currently, I guess I've already kind of done it. Uh, I went out and I chiseled some ground and, you know, left the chisel marks in the ground about a foot deep and then, you know, variable rated some dry that rolled down in the chisel marks and then VT'd over it, you know, just trying to, trying to get more nutrients in my top foot instead of, you know, focusing on my, you know, top few inches, you know, trying to make more fertile soil on my top foot and I don't have a bunch of flashy fancy equipment you know and I'm just trying to do the best I can with what I got so we're gonna you know just that's something that I that I got you know ground's frozen up right now but it looks good so we're gonna try that so <laughs> excellent well I'm gonna put more Veltima out um, okay right. so now play with it you know we just had an experiment this past year and you know we put on a particular specific time so experiment with that, and then also outside of that, I've been in a continuous or never-till environment, and 
just like Levi said, experiment with some strip-till type technologies and, and we we're incorporating a soil water the last couple of years and seeing some unique <coughs> things about that. And in doing so, all that is helping me in my planting process just to make sure I stop the sins of that. And you know, once the corn comes up uniformly, which is their goal, then now you're enhancing the entire crop. So when we make the Veltima application or whatever <laughs> inputs we're applying, we're influenced 100% of that crop as opposed to what percentage of it came up uniformly. And just trying to keep enhancing that. Uh, for me this year, we're going to try some uh, corn after corn no till. Uh, 20 inch rows were on, so high population. Uh, we really haven't tried in the past because they're afraid Why of are you going to do that? I think uh, mainly in the state of Ohio, I think the way we're going with uh, watershed problems, things like that, we're, we could be forced to go down that road here shortly. Okay. So uh, better start practicing now and try different ways. Uh, we're trying different uh, available rates on with the fertility and try to back things off. Because okay. once again, I, I think there could be a day with the regulations that we won't have a choice. So instead of finding out how to do it after somebody tells you you got to do it, I'd better find out on my own time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we're going to try different things with that and back it off and try to trash management and still get good emergence. versions. Uh, we're more of a spring and prey operation, I like to call it. We don't have two by two. We don't have strip till. We're all dry box. We're all ju just liquid, liquid in for uh, So uh, we're kind of limited to what we can do until uh, I can talk in the whole team to make some equipment changes. So we've got to work with. Okay. So we we'll try to do the best, the best that we can with, with, with what we have. Yeah, thanks for sharing. Well, coming from the Chesapeake Bay watershed, you better be cognizant of regulation because it is going to come. That's I yeah, And uh, you just need to be a forward thinker on that as well. Documentation is key. Good insight. Randy, what you well, for us in the southeast, I mean, it's not a matter of if we're going to get disease. It's not a matter of which disease. It's when it's coming and how many times we have to come back. Um, we get disease in cotton, small grains, peanuts, you name it. Yeah. Produce, corn, soybeans, every crop just about gets spread with fungicide of some capacity. <clears throat> so I've challenged BASF with a couple things that... Uh, I want to understand, can we make the product work even better? Uh, I've asked them at uh, RTP, and I also asked them when we were in Germany. Um, maybe we can figure out, you know, the older products and the new products, how they can work a little bit better. Um, we, we've discovered that through the next level. Uh, program me and David's kind of spearheading and talking about and helping growers all over the country. Uh, we had headline amp on our corn acres and you know, we're starting to see that, you know, the southern rust issue is a big deal in the southeast. And so glad, so glad to see how team come along because you can see it to the inch where we sprayed it. So we're getting a little more residual control, longer control out of Altima. And as far as Revitech is concerned, I was this close to crop destruct on that 190 bushel beans. This close, Robbie. I think we got it about 10 days before we harvested. 10 days. I trialed it in that spot that yielded 190. Uh, we were this close to crop destruction because EPA had not registered it yet. I rolled the dice and I said, they tell me they think they're going to get it passed. <laughs> well, I think Georgia kind of drugged her feet just a little bit and Josh led me the right way. I talked to Paula several times and I think Paula was actually uh, on vacation at the beach with her kid. She said, good news, it just passed. <laughs> So I was this close to not being able to crop construct on those on those beans, so we were pleased, but very excited about the new technologies to help control where we just have a problem with disease. Looking forward to the future in that area as well, testing ways to make it better and make make sure that we're using it correctly. Excellent. Let me let me switch to crop inputs and uh, give give the audience here an idea of what you're thinking about there. The uh, so. When, when do you plant, or how do you, you know, how do you choose your seeding rates and your timing of your planting, all those sorts of things? Talk about that a little bit. What practices you've adopted, or maybe things you've 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 learned and now you've changed, and this has become your practice. Well, I'm a guy that I like to avoid risk. Um, I do my best to spread that risk. 
okay. as much as I can. And I hate following you. I'm a guy that, uh, <laughs> well, you started it. <laughs> but <clears throat> I, I like to spread risk, and you know, we don't know what planning. We can't trust a meteorologist three days, right? So we don't know if we're going to have a cloudy year, if we're going to have, you know, a sunshine premium year. And we've all seen the effects of planting crops too thick and getting tipped back in kernel abortion. And you go to the edge of the field at the same population where there is no, where there isn't an edge effect, where there is, you know, plenty of sunlight, there is no corner, you know, kernel abortion and tip back. So that's our ways of, I guess, cause and puts at planting. Um, a lot of people use those in the markets every day to hedge your bets. They can sell a day and still be in the game if markets go up or down. So we, we're a big advocate on you know, varying populations just because we don't know what the weather's going to be like 60, 70, 80, 90 days later. And so we do that on a lot of acres. And as far as contest acres, obviously we're trying to learn from those acres to see what we learned there to put on larger portions of the farm. So. <coughs> We've pretty much adopted the beans first strategy, uh, mainly to save ourselves from ourselves. Uh, okay. That was always the first chance he could get. He was getting out in that field and he was going to plant corn. When's that? When's, when's early? Uh, April. Okay. We've been trying some March beans, but we still have snow on the ground in March, so we haven't had the opportunity. I'm not, not going to try some, just to say we tried it. I'm not right. going to give it a legitimate chance. So okay. We haven't been there yet. Uh, well, we typically try to get our beans out. Uh, we've seen that beans, you know, they, they enjoy the stress early. Uh, corn, we, we want to get, you know, that corn up out of the ground and going. And we can't have it have a bad day early. So, uh, soil temperature wise, you know, we can save ourselves from that. And uh, variable rating, we, we will vary the rate anywhere from a, about an 8,000 uh, population swing on corn, uh, north narrow rows. You know, our poorer soils, we enjoy being able to drop down that population. It's really helping. I mean, we're not going to break any yield records with it, but well, in the pocketbook, it sure does help. 20 intros. Right? On the 20 yeah. intros, correct. Okay. And then on our better ground, you know, we can, we can push it up a little bit and be able to still be able to feed it and, and still hit, 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 hit that yield goal. You know, beans has just been the complete opposite. We, we have yet to really find the bottom barrel of that bean. You know, we thought it was at 100, then 80, now 60. You know, this year our threshold was 35,000 to the weather. So as long as we had a stand of 35,000, we was going with it. Excellent. Good. Listen, I'm in the seed business. If you saying 35,000 seed population on soybeans, I'm going to lose sales. <laughs> um, but now, risk management, like Randy said, we're in the seed business, so you know we try to diversify. But in reference to corn, Similar to Randy, but the next step I do is I split uh, the planter. I plant two different hybrids. And we, I spent a lot of time pre-season talking with my uh, Pioneer rep, my Donegro rep, or whomever, and try to match hybrids that have similar maturity dates but different flowering dates. And the experiment years ago was <coughs> white corn and yellow corn. To see how that would actually uh, what it would express, particularly in a stressed environment, because most of our acres is dry land, and you know on the southeast you're seven to ten days from a drought, so mitigating risk is key. And if you change the populations, I know I, I challenged Alice as she tried to explain it up here with a different population and different hybrids in that Veltima trial, uh, but she got some you know, rewarding data I, I trust, and you know we're all in this and. Um, mitigate risk, and that's how a couple of ways I do outside of, of the seed business. We're kind of opposite of Corey. We plant 36 inch rows, so we've played with population a little bit with a twin row planter to try to bridge that gap a little bit. We might can touch more on exactly how he decides to do that. But. Yeah, I, uh, we, so we cold germ test our corn when we get it, like the actual seed that I'm going to plant, and that kind of gives me a better idea of what can handle a little bit more cold soil temperatures because we, I mean, I planted corn May 17th last year and it still got down to 38 degrees that night and that's not ideal. Um, we're up against the late insurance planting date of April or of May 25th and after that they reduced coverage and so you know, we got to just do the best we can for what we have and uh, we'll So Levi, have you ever seen chilling inhibition on corn? 
the, the damage it can do by yeah. putting and getting that cold drink uh, water. Yeah. I'm just curious. Yeah, it, it, it doesn't look good. No, it's, it's not fun. fun. It, it, I mean, and I've, I've, I've watched some of my neighbors go out and plant early, and that corn doesn't come up for 16 days. I mean, and then when it does, there's dip, dip, you know, yeah. it's not good. <laughs> you know, it, that's, yeah, it's, yeah. Well, it's tough. It's tough. Excellent. So, and uh, fertility, how's, how's fertility play? Or how do you, are you managing it the same way you always have, or is you, have you changed anything the way you fertilize? Uh, we grid sample, uh, we variable rate. Um, it's all about uh, keeping your, in, putting the nutrients where they need to be. You know, if your field's really high in FOSS here, well, you don't want to add more FOSS. I mean, if you're at a level where, you know, you get achieve your yield goal, you know, we need to put it over here, you know. So, um, we kind of try to, you know, put the nutrients where they need to be. We also uh, tissue sample, you know, see what's actually getting into the plant. Okay. Not just, you know, you can have it all in your soil, but if it's not available and getting into the plant, it's not doing much good. So, you know, those kind of go hand in hand to okay. work with that. Good. Well, like I mentioned, I'm in the Chesapeake Bay watershed. So, um, we have nutrient management plans. And, you know, my granddad, he was one of the first ones to break 100 bushels. You know, he had a different fertility plan than my dad when he broke 200. Then what I do when we broke three, four hundred on up, and we realize is you're going to push yields, you have to feed the crop. You don't want the crop to have a bad day. But the neat thing about the technology and the equipment and the information we have today, like Levi said, tissue sampling. I'm not just pouring fertilizer on, we're spoon feeding it throughout the growing season as the crop is indicating that, hey, you have the potential to make more bushels. And then we apply more. And if it's irrigated, we fertigate. If it's dry land, we'll use a wide drops or air post application spray, sprayer to make applications. As long as the crop is expressing itself, it is going to utilize that nutrients. And then, if for some reason we get a hurricane, and we'll plant a small grain crop to capture all that. So we're still being fiscally responsible as well as environmentally sound, and that's key. Just like you're talking about in Ohio, it's going to be real. And that's something that we're, we're practicing on. Our, 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 our fertility rate, we keep pulling back, but we're not doing it all up front anymore. We're trying to spread it out throughout that season. We try to do lower rates, but more when that crop needs it, instead of being an all up front operation. And that's where we really start seeing a benefit from it. My CECs are 4 to 7. Organic matter is less than 1%. So, with that being the case, I, I don't have a lot of the holding capacity, and so we have to partition fertilizer over time. And there is a nutrient component to yield. Levi mentioned it. It doesn't matter what's in the soil, it matters what's in the plant. I don't know anybody on the planet that can look at the soil and tell what's in it by looking at it. I also don't know anybody on the planet that can look at the plant and tell what the nutrient values are by looking at it. So, we've got to have data again. We pull soil samples every year, we pull tissue samples every week. We're constantly looking and assessing, you know what that nutrient level looks like in the plant. Is it available? Is it, is it is, are the levels to the point that I can have made these kind of yields before, my yield goals? And if my yield goals, you know, need to change, I'll do that. And then we use, obviously, irrigation and different methods to get it in the root zone. Because it really doesn't matter what you apply. It ultimately matters what gets in the plant. But if, for it to get in the plant, it needs to be in the root zone. So we're looking at, you know, in furrow, two by two, two by two by two, feeding both sides of the plant, strip till, you know, fertigation, a lot of different application methods to check that box. You know, you said nobody knows how the, you know, the soil what to fertilize for, but nobody pulls a tissue sample knows what levels should be. That's exactly to right. To cover the yield that we're trying to get, which is unique that Randy alluded to the next level groups. You know, that's things that, there are people out there, the universities don't know. You know, we've been growing corn and you know, studying corn for a century and a half now. And it's amazing how little we know, particularly in the fertility arena. We know what it removes, but what does it actually need to produce that crop that we're striving for? Well, David, now you're poking the bear. I know. Because <laughs> when I did the science behind an event six, eight years ago, I don't yeah. remember, that was one of the questions I asked you guys. And I asked, Everywhere I go, every university I've ever spoke for, every crop consultant, every lab, everybody that's a crop physiologist, every agronomist, every C, you know, if they've got a CCA, whatever. How much of each nutrient does it take to make a bushel of corn or soybean? 
I got any crop for that matter. What are the levels we must maintain in the plant? At any point in that plant's life, when the yield goes, we cut it. Whether I've spoken to Iowa State, Illinois, NC State. Crickets. They don't know this answer. And that's a shame. We've been doing that research for 150 years. And they can't tell me at 450 GDUs, if I got a 308 bushel yield goal or 300 bushel yield goal, what levels I need to maintain the plant for that yield goal. That makes sense. So, David has poked the bear. <laughs> and that is one of the things that we are challenging the university, USDA, on funding and dollars, how money is being partitioned for research, and BASF in Germany three weeks ago. I asked them to do the same thing. So, it's a good question. What's important for us as growers? Because if, as we're, you know, for the economics, we got to produce more. Everybody says, well, if you more price is going to go down. But for us to be sustainable, we have to have more bushels at our ROI level. And we need to know what it takes to get those bushels. Very good. The, uh, so, <clears throat> managing weeds, you haven't talked about managing weeds. You guys don't have resistant weeds on <coughs> your farm or not a problem? I think we're the epicenter of Roundup Resistant Pig Weekend. Uh, they started in the southeast, and I want to drop some from the sky every time I fly into the Midwest. <laughs> so they can have a challenge. I mean, they, they can grow 200 bushel corn and not even try, right? And Is that true? they got to have some kind of challenge. Can't just let him get away with that. He's not lying. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, for us, it's serious, and it's serious in all crops that we grow. Um, we're having to use multiple modes of action, pre's, multiple pre's, post, hand labor. And I spent last year on peanuts alone about 60 bucks an acre in hand labor. Hand labor? Hand labor, pulling pig weeds. $60 an acre. So, no pressure. I would ask. I mothership, BSF. I said, we need some help on peanuts. We, we, do, still a good job. Job. we do a pretty good job with corn. Okay. And we've got a lot of great products out there on corn to help, and beans to help control big weeds. But for us, you know, weed management and peanuts is a, is, we need another option. Corey, how about you? Ours is, you know, giant rags, mare's tail. Those are two pesky weeds, but, you know, now with Ingenia. No longer a problem anymore. Virginia takes it out. Okay. Yeah. Very good. Dave, how about you? Anything? Um, yeah, I mean, we rotation's key, and you know, once you find the pest that's resistant, it's too late. So, you know, we've transitioned to a lot more pre's, and then we've played with Liberty Chemistry. You know, the seed business, particularly in the soybean side, you know, we grow everything from conventional Liberty, uh, Eugenia, or dicamba beans and enlist beans. So we've played with it all. If you have a problem, you just need to know what chemistry to start out with and address it. Don't let it become an issue. Um, hand labor, we don't pay for hand labor, but um, I pull a lot of weeds if I see them. You know, we're not gonna let it go to seed if we can. Tell like you already trained. Come to Georgia and I'll push it. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> not interesting. You got too many naps. You do have that. Yeah. How about you guys? Oh, I got a couple of sharp corn knives at home. Um, uh, my dad's always been a stickler on never letting weeds go, get away, and uh, we really don't have much pressure. There are some resistant weeds, but uh, we kind of implement a little bit of tillage along with the new chemistry, you know, the engineering. And, and we were really, we we're pretty fortunate, really. so we can't complain much at all on the weed side of it. But we've gotten there just from family before us being good stewards of the land. And taking control of that early and making sure it doesn't become a bigger problem. Put a no-fly zone over land for Randy. Over your farm. It's coming. <laughs> <laughs> and that's not because I'm going to drop a seed. I'm just telling you, it's coming. So I got it. A, lot, a lot of people feel like that they don't want to. Well, it would be a problem and I'll address it then. Uh, that is a proactive approach, not a reactive approach, because it's a problem. People need to make sure they're cognizant of that. This problem with big weeds, I can assure you. Yeah, we, we, we agree. So we just a couple more questions, but uh, the previous group showed you some new technologies, or technology to think about. I know you guys are experimenting with other technologies, but talk about the one technology you're going to adopt new different this year. 
from a technology standpoint, not a, not a, not a BSF chemistry, not something like that, but a technology that you're going to adopt this year. And then, we'll, then I'm going to ask you the, the last question of the, of the, uh, of the discussion about uh, the early tech trials. But, Technology. Uh, yeah, I, I want to get into the climate field view. Um, it's been something I've been looking at a lot. Um, I might do the free trial this year to get started, and I need to get my dad out of the combine so I can uh, put some more technology and yield data stuff in there. But uh, he, he doesn't like to wait and calibrate, and uh, he's kind of a little rammy in there. So, uh, <laughs> but uh, yeah, he, he's good help. But uh, <laughs> don't record that. <laughs> Too late. <laughs> Just because I don't have to pay him, so. <laughs> <laughs> Levi, I'll give you a piece of advice. Um, upgrade that deal, Monk. It's hard to manage and you know change anything you don't measure. Yeah, I, and I don't care how smart you are. You can't remember where the highest yield was in the field in your brain and record it, and then go back to that exact spot and understand where that highest yield was and say, you know what? The rest of the field average was 225, and I had 19 spots that made 290. Why? So adapt that data. I, you I, won't forget it, and you won't regret it. I know I can't tell you where the highest spot is, because I'm usually sitting in line in the semis. So you yeah. already got spots in the field that can teach you. Mm -hmm. you know, could right? you make it that year? In, yeah. Under the same weather. Yeah. And everybody likes a blank lot. The weather. But, yeah. So even in adverse conditions, you're making a higher yield. So I, I would have highly encourage you to start yeah. there. I, I agree with you 100%. Good advice. Anybody else want to share technology you're going to adopt this year? As in equipment or outside of that? Equipment or outside of that? Could um, be outside of that. Could be. Yeah. The biological arena. And, you know, the, you know, we're really good at identifying things above ground. The below ground is just more intriguing because, like Levi said, you can have stuff in the soil and never show up in the tissue. Well, how can we enhance whatever's below ground to assure we're going to be more efficient with what applications we made? Uh, I, I feel we've been playing with that for years. Still don't understand it, but we're seeing uh, benefits and dividends from it. So more of that. Okay. And you know, I love I love new paint. So. But, and then that stick, <laughs> that stick that um, they talked about, that's kind of neat too. So. Yeah, I've already challenged them to give us a couple options uh, to make this work and streamline my process of learning for sure. Okay. And so we were chatting at the break about some ideas, so we're, we're looking forward to collaborating for sure. Thanks. For anything, as far as technology, we're just going to work on getting what we already had for uh, 19 to work right for 2020. Uh, we tried out some new uh, new combines. We had number one, number two released. Okay. That was a headache, and now uh, we might be having another black partner show up at our shop here soon to try out. So we have enough on our plate right now as far as hard okay. big equipment. We need to get ironed out and make sure it can actually show up there in the post post report. So what color was that kind? Black. Uh, that's a problem. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so Rev X fields. We, we saw earlier some of the examples uh, that uh, we talked about how we tested, but maybe just share your experience. And we'll start with uh, Jenna and Levi here first, and just talk about your Rev X field trial experience. It, it was a it was a really really good experience. Um, when we got asked to do it, I was I was really excited. I knew they kind of released, you know, here last year that you know, it was going to hopefully be available. And uh, really, to me, it felt more like a program, a trial. I mean, um, my innovation specialist Jordan Moody was there every step of the way, explaining everything, what they're going to do, you know, the actives, and we was in the field with me, and you know, we're looking at plant health. He was there when we harvested, and you know, really took it from, you know. Point A to point Z, really. I mean, it was okay. it was a it was a full process, and I mean, to have I've never had a, a, a trial or a program like that where somebody is there for so much support, you know. And then, you know, we're all farmers, and they they gave the product to us, so we all like that. So. <laughs> I don't know. Sometimes it costs you money. Yeah. <laughs> right. And and then uh, uh, Acre Ag did a great job with the the NDVI imaging and I mean, that was just a really nice piece to it to be able to follow it on there and you know and it was just 
all around outstanding job by BSF to to help us with the trial with the with the program I might say because like I said it didn't feel like a trial it really felt mm -hmm. like a, a team group program effort you know really. yeah very much a team effort they came in, they explained everything to us every step of the way. I don't know how many times companies have wanted us to try something, and it's like, here it is, try it. And then there's not even any follow-up or any checking on us throughout the season. And the whole team was there multiple times going through our field with us and have, sitting down having lunch with us, explaining the process. And it was like, wow, they care about this product. They think it's going to be something big. And so they really made it a priority for us and just really helped us through the whole thing and helped us understand the whole process and the technology behind it, which is so beneficial to yeah. And we probably better say that uh, it was eight bushels better than Delaro and five bushels better than Trivacro. So, I mean, it, it did at the end, it, it did perform too. And that's okay. reassuring because we had the team and then the product did speak for itself at the end of the season. So, okay. that's exciting. Excellent. Thank you for sharing that. So, when they contacted us about trying the trial, you know, it's like, all right, they wanted it next to a control. And I said, you know, my control, I don't. I'm not a huge fan of just like no application because that's going to cost me money. And I was concerned because my control was pre XR and headline amp. So if you're going to outperform that and you got your hands full, and Charles coming out with acres and then having an opportunity, um, which I feel sorry for Miss Alice because she lived close enough to me that I'd call her and, and we'd have some uh, communication. But you know, she was out there and and like Levi and Jenna said, you know, that group effort and you know, the plant health was there. I was so happy. I wasn't worried about crop to struck, but I was happy and grateful that we had an opportunity to use it on some production too. Because, you know, we did the trial and the drone was showing some things that I hadn't seen before. And the plant health was better. But then when that product became commercial, we still had one more spray on that high yield of corn and they got LT on. So we had pre sorry headline amp and then Veltima to, to finish it off. So thumbs up to y'all for that. Yeah, I, I pretty much already had to go find Alice this morning and apologize to her for all the calls we had back and forth. Oh, because I felt bad for her. You know, this year, you know, for us, it was a wet one. Yeah. Okay. And she was calling and coordinating, and she's doing such a great job of, uh, hey, I need this, this, and this. And, and laying things out for me. And I was in no mood to talk to her on the phone half the time. <laughs> <laughs> so I just wanted to apologize to her in person because, you know, it's, it's a rough spring. And then trying to spray, she kept asking, have you played it yet? I'm thinking, we just got four inches of rain last night. Don't ask me that. <laughs> you know, once again, I just wasn't in the mood to hear about it. Yeah. So, but, you know, Matt did a great job. I mean, we just had everybody <clears throat> from a whole team. It, you know, we try a lot of products. So normally, here's your jug. Let us know if it does any good. You don't hear back from it. And this was constant <coughs> communication throughout the year. We did a trial on corn, we did a trial on beans, and you know, we was able to see them both. And I set them up not to win. Because, you know, to be frank, it gets old, you know, having every company try the latest and greatest, try the latest and greatest, everybody's got the latest and greatest. You know, so if they're going to earn our business, we want them to work for it. And first year right out the gate, they did it. It was on corn and beans. And corn ended up being around eight and a half bushel. Tricked on corn over, over the, the Laura, or no, it was over headline amp. And then on my trial that we did, it was a little bit different than the data that, that they pulled together. It was two and a half bushel over, over, over the Laura. So and we're tickled to death. I mean, we're going to keep utilizing on more and more acres this year. And you know, we're really going to try to see if I can cut out that R2, R3 pass and let the team arrive from R1 on. Because you're two to three passes. Okay. Yeah, we, we need three, three passes. Okay. Thanks. Definition of insanity is what? Doing the same thing over and over, over again and yeah. expecting different results. When the headline came out, there was a catchphrase called plant health. Yep. Everybody followed the lead. We got plant health too. They want to describe it just a little bit better. All right? Yeah. <coughs> One cool thing I found with you guys is that your number one problem, as Josh mentioned, is that believability. Product repeatability, product performance that works constantly, right? Across multiple fields, different environments, et cetera. And you're trying to break and help growers understand that it is repeatable and you're doing it independent of just 
giving some product away or just doing the trials at your own leisure or your own you know, locations and then reporting, we saw it next amount of research. Now you put it in real world scenarios, you're putting it in field trial settings, you're, you're looking at the data uh, objectively and you take the good and the bad. And that's one nice thing I feel like doing a third party of being independent. And I'm going to make a prediction. Just like the plant health, the rest of them will follow you and this lead because you're going to create some believability again. And they'll benefit, the competition will benefit, but they'll start doing the trials too, right? So it's not all bad being a trend sire instead of a trend follower, right? Yeah, I think farmers are going to benefit a lot. Yep, I agree. Very good. Thank you very much. Really appreciate you sharing your, your experiences and some of your ideas to on your farm for this year and share with each other and then hopefully with other farmers we'll get to hear this message. So thank you very much and best of luck for the 2020. Thank you. I appreciate the opportunity. Thank you.